That's great. I think uh, if it's OK with everyone, then we're going to to kick off. And um, thank you, everyone, for joining us for um, the second in our new Launch and Learn series. And um, this one is brought to you by popular demand. There are a number of uh, people across the organisation, North and South, have very much been um, asking in, in recent months uh, with regard to just how do, how, do, how do we govern um, as a charity and who's on our board and the role of some of our board uh, trustees. And um, so we've decided that we'd place a governance front and centre at the very beginning um, of our lunch and learns. And we're delighted today to welcome our group chairman, um, Mr. Alan McCartney, um, to join us today. And I know many of you, uh, some of you will know um, Alan. Alan has been with us uh, for a long time um, and others um, of you, a lot, a lot more new staff may not have had the opportunity yet to have met Alan. So what I thought we would do just before um, Alan shares um, some of his uh, overview with regard to the governance uh, of um, extern North and South, and he will be then supported by Johnny and Gavin. Um, it's just really to in introduce you to Alan. Um, and I have three lovely questions I'm asking on your behalf uh, for for you, Alan, today. So um, I hope you're I hope you're ready and up for it. Uh, I suppose for all of us, um, Alan, uh, you know, we get up in the morning every day and particularly so many of us in the organization who are working on the frontline services and that's what gets you up every day. Um, you know that you're out on the front line and uh, you love you love working with, with our service users. But maybe if I could turn that to you, Alan, I mean, what gets you up in the morning? Um. <laughs> I think this is a horrible question. <laughs> um, I find it hard to get up in the morning, so you might have found one of my weak weak points there, Sharon. Um, I, I suppose <clears throat> thinking about myself and looking back reflectively, I, I would say I've always I've never stood still in anything I've been doing. I've always thrived on kind of change and improvement. Uh, and that might come from having an engineering background and um, throughout my working life um, really thought that engineering matched my my um, desire to understand how things work and look for better ways to do things and I've had I've been fortunate I suppose in, in all the roles I've had over the years to to see where I can bring change and improvement and those have featured quite heavily in the roles I've had and, and as I progressed in a career and up through management um, I was part of a team that brought NIE through major change um, into privatisation and then later I was appointed to a board that was required to set up the RQIA that everybody in our organisation would be familiar with so there I was looking for an organization that would improve quality in health and social care and really look for good access for everybody. Overview, I suppose it was a natural move from engineering to want to change and improve and help um, people's lives. There must be an ingrained social conscience um, in me somewhere that leads me into this kind of area, Sharon, I suppose. Yeah. Absolutely. No, that, that's lovely to hear, Alan. I suppose that very, you know, it gives us a great segue then into, you know, of all the worthy organisations that there are in Northern Ireland and many charities um, doing great work um, that you could have chosen to, to volunteer with. Um, I suppose why why extern? And, and also really just even before you answer that, it's really important because I'm not sure if everyone knows that all our board trustees are volunteers. I mean, you very much are a volunteer and have been for many, many years. So why extern? Yeah, you, you make it sound like I've been here forever, but I suppose it is heading that direction in that I've been there nine years. Next month I joined in 2013 um, as, as a trustee and board member. Um, it, it almost came about by accident. I was I was working in a number of different boards and um, issues in, in, in the province and uh, the RQIA and one of the medical people in the RQIA recommended extern to me and when I looked at the values it had um, its desire to help the vulnerable um, and disadvantaged that kind of was the space that the RQIA was in the um, 
RQIA was seeking to roll out good services to everybody and make health and social care available to everybody, particularly those that couldn't speak up for themselves. Um, and then I suppose to, I, I have been since 2005, I think, a lay magistrate in Northern Ireland. That is a role that um, deals with young people and families in distress. Um, so I, I kind of felt there was a big fit between the justice element of lay magistrate and seeing families in distress in, in family proceedings court, for example, and the work I've been doing with RQIA and the health um, factors and it's all social conscious space. So external is a very good fit and the values that extern had fitted my values um, and integrity and accountability and values like that um, ring bells with me. So yes, I, 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 um, I think I'm in the right space. I don't think I could have chosen a, a better charity to go with. Uh, I don't think anyone ever else invited me to be truthful as the other side of the coin. Mm. No, no, it's, that's that's excellent, and 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 you very much have uh, also introduced us to uh, another role that you have. So you have a very busy and and varied life. Uh, that is a lay magistrate, um, and I suppose that, that that's a, a a different way of um, you know, working and what you have to do. And I'm sure you have to make some very difficult decisions, and that dispensing of judgment uh, can't be an easy thing to do. And how do you reconcile that, that work with the work that you do here in Extern, where we're uh, an organisation with that a uh, non-judgmental ethos? You know, how do how does that fit for you? That's a bit intriguing, really. Um, it's it's not as bad a position as the question might lead us to believe. Um, it's not so much in conflict. Um, when I think about the work of Family Proceedings Court, um, what the bench is trying to do there is seek the very best outcomes for the young children under the children's order. Um, so what Extern is trying to do is improve and perhaps preclude a family getting into difficulties and ending up in court because court is a bit of a blunt instrument. But in sense of making wise decisions, I think, and, and providing sound help, I think the two bodies are both trying to do the same thing, essentially. Um, when we come towards youth court that I also do, quite a lot of that is not about um, the criminal court that sends people down and sentences them. Quite a bit of the work is more about restorative justice and helping people understand um, how they've got to where they've got and how they might take a better path in life and making them see the effect they've had on other people that they might might have uh, targeted in some criminal spree. So it's not too far apart in my um, I think they both have similar objectives and I love to get cases in court where extern features in the court reports and court files that says extern is helping this family do this or extern is helping this young person go there um, and support them because extern does feature quite well in, in court files at the moment but everyone I see I love to see. That's excellent. No, thank you, thank you, Alan. Thank you for giving us that that broad broad overview and really linking the, those two roles together. And we're all about those positive outcomes for for everyone that, that we work with. So thank you very much for sharing that. Um, and that nicely just brings us into um, our, our presentation today, our lunch and learn. Um, uh, and I'll share the uh, presentation now with, of which Alan will lead us in. Uh, and that's around really the importance and that huge importance of governance um, uh, for extern um, across the island of Ireland. Ireland. So I'm just going to share the, the presentation and hand over to you, Alan. Just bear with me one moment, everyone. I'm going to ask uh, just as we go through, if it's OK, if if there if you have any burning questions uh, as we go throughout, please do put them in the chat and uh, I'll monitor those and then bring those up at the end. And equally, um, 
we can wait to the end and we'll just use the hand um, icon and I will find my way around uh, everyone and uh, bring the questions forward. So um, if you if you wouldn't mind doing that, that would be great. And may I also ask anyone just to turn off your um, microphones? There's just a little bit of interference. Um, I'll turn off mine now and then each time the, the speaker is on presenting, we'll just have that one that one microphone on. So thank you very much. And over to you, Alan, and I, and I will move through the slides as best I can. Thanks very much. Um, yes, the topic today is fascinating to me, perhaps because I have been involved in governance at various levels and various organisations through the years. Um, it's really lovely to be with you. I, I value the opportunity to meet people in the organisation and I value the shared understanding that we can get of how an organisation ticks um, and moves itself forward and defines itself in a sense. Um, so what is governance is, is a good question to start off with and how does a board govern? Uh, every charity that know, you know has a board and in fact lots of other bodies have boards as well. So my background was NIE um, and NIE had a board and some of the board were full-time employees and some of the board were people in from outside um, and that that is the body that oversees an organization. In the case of a charity, it's, it's the governing body that delivers the governance of the charity and adheres to the charity's code of governance. And we'll say a little bit about that later. But moving on, I'm kind of interested to tease out what the understanding of the term governance is, because it is different for different people. Um, and there are definitions that come up on the screen now um, of governance, but basically governance is the system by which any organisation is directed and controlled. So it defines the rights and the responsibilities by the different stakeholders, who participates in the organisation, what the procedures are for making big decisions. And there's a bit of an intangible side to governance as well, and that's about uh, it's relying on able and curious and courageous people who work well together. And that's really what we need in any organization to make it tick. It's the relationships as well as the processes and procedures. So today we're going to talk a little bit about board governance, but at the outset, I think it's, it's necessary to stress that governance is the job of everybody in the organization, it extends to every member of Extern all management, all staff, all volunteers, we have an input to good governance and sound practices at all times. And it's really important because this is where the confidence of regulators and funders and clients and the general public in the charity comes from if we all employ good governance. As we've said earlier, the board are all volunteers and the charity also has other volunteers. Board trustees give quite a lot of time actually and um, freely to serve extern. So none of us are paid anything for our time or expertise, and that would be outside the charity law if we did. We're kind of accountable for what extern does and how it does it. And we have to be able to justify things to anybody that queries it. So when the big issues come up, it's the trustees that have to answer questions about safeguarding. And we had that issue in extern back in 2019 and carried forward into 2020. Um, we had the uh, Department for Economy in Northern Ireland querying extern works and what was going on in there, all of those things. And we've had TUSLA back and forward in Ireland checking up on funding and all those kind of things. Those are things that trustees have to deal with. Um, we have under charity code, we have a, a number of publications that help us understand our, our things in the little book that the uh, charity in Northern Ireland works to is the Code of Good Governance, and it outlines seven key principles for a charity. So it's about leadership and getting the legal requirements right. It's about working and checking that the, the finances of a charity are good. It's about having um, a a system for seeing that the charity is doing what it's meant to do. And in public life, 
people subscribe to those kind of principles or the Nolan principles in public life, which are very parallel to those as well. If we moved on to the question of how a charity is actually governed, we would then think about the legal basis, which is the bedrock of any company. Um, and you end up having to understand a bit of company law because the charities are generally formed as a company limited by guarantee. And Extern has three of those companies, Extern Group and Extern Northern Ireland and Extern Ireland, three companies limited by guarantee. A company limited by guarantee is a distinct legal entity. It's democratic, it has membership, it has directors, and the key thing is that there's nobody to benefit out of it if profits are, are made. Uh, director liability um, is limited. It's formally required to submit to Companies House every year its annual report and its accounts. And of course, other laws apply as, as you operate a company. Employment law is in there, health and safety law is in there, child protection law and charity law is in there. The company articles and memorandum is a funny phrase on that slide. It means that it's kind of the constitution of a charity and it documents the rules on top of the law which the charity is required to follow. So an article and memorandum for extern group will be registered at Company House. It will also be registered with a charity regulator, the charity commission. And <clears throat> that's why we have a charity number and that's why we have an NI number, which is our company number registered at Company House. It sets out the purpose for which this charity is, is established and it defines who it's going to benefit and it defines the area, the geographical area that it operates in. And then as a director, I'm required to use my independent judgment. I'm required to promote the success of the charity. I'm required to bring my care, my skill, my expertise, my diligence to the good of the company. I'm not allowed to favour myself in any decision making or favour anybody else in any decision making. That's kind of my responsibilities in there. We can move on um, and I think we're going to talk a little bit just about where the board sits and how it sits against the staff. The board carries the legal can if you like. If something goes wrong. The board is required to operate in line with the company articles and memorandum. If we require to change those, we have to change them with permission of the regulator and permission of Companies House. The board sets out the overall strategy for the organisation, sets the vision for the organisation, where it wants to get to in the future. It's responsible for governance and finance, keeping good accounts and submitting those in a timely way to Companies House. The board appoints the chief executive of the charity and the board then um, carries that weight as the employer of all the staff. So it's, it's important that we understand all the HR issues um, for staff and it's important that the board monitors that the charity is doing what it's meant to do in its articles and it's doing it well and effectively. So that's where accountability comes in. The board requires the chief executive and senior leadership team to bring performance reports and show that the charity is doing that. That's part of the job. We can scroll on down through staff responsibilities because they're slightly different. A lot of things are delegated to the chief executive and senior leadership team. Um, in actually running the charity, that doesn't take away the responsibility from the board of knowing that things are done and done right and done well. Um, that kind of takes me through, Sharon, to to a natural break point. Um, I could I could say that the extern has three boards because it has three companies. I could introduce you to my fellow trustees at this point. Um, we have trustees. Uh, in extern Northern Ireland. We have seven of them. We have extern group board and we have extern Ireland board. Um, and it's good to, good to have the collective wisdom 
of people of experience at board level and um, contributing to the governance of the charity. And it's then good to go and apply for new contracts and be able to say that our governance is in good, good shape. Uh, and recently in one of our assessments, um, Gavin was pleased to bring forward that we had scored five out of five um, in terms of governance rating, um, which was encouraging to us. We're not standing on our laurels. We need to bring new trustees in. We need to refresh boards from time to time. We're actively doing that at the moment. And we do try to bring people in of wisdom and sound judgment and experience in finance or law or social work or the wider society needs. Um, and that's, that's where we, we get our trustees from. Sharon, I think I'm that's about done. Yes, thank you very much, Alan. Um, we much appreciate that. Uh, Gavin is going to take us through just the overview of how the operating companies work uh, alongside the board uh, committees. So thank you, Gavin. Thank you, Sharon. Uh, thank you, Alan. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. It's great uh, to be with you all to talk, talk to you uh, a little bit about uh, how externs board governance uh, functions. One, one of the really uh, interesting, I've had a couple of interesting conversations with staff about this and uh, because SLT is uh, so close to working with the board, um, you know, obviously we're we, we're very familiar with all of the terminology that we use around uh, board governance. But uh, I suppose we we've, we've always been conscious conscious that you know, in conversation with staff, we talk about committees and boards and that sort of thing. And uh, really, what this session is about is to uh, give staff a a, a better a, a, and a greater understanding of uh, how governance uh, works within the organisation. So. As Alan has indicated uh, in his presentation, um, th there are um, three operating, uh, sorry, three companies uh, within the overall uh, extern structure. So extern group, uh, we describe it as the parent company, uh, and beneath it are two operating companies, which we also uh, describe as, uh, as subsidiary companies. Uh, so they are Extern Ireland and uh, Extern Northern Ireland. Yes, yeah, so we have um, uh, Extern Group as the uh, parent company, uh, and also uh, beneath that, uh, two operating companies, which we also describe as subsidiary companies. So they are Extern Ireland and Extern Northern Ireland. In previous years, you may have heard of uh, other subsidiary companies. For example, in the past, uh, we also had uh, Ross Core Youth Village. Uh, in, in place as a subsidiary company uh, and also extern supporting communities uh, was one of the subsidiary companies of the uh, organisation, but both Ross Core Youth Village and uh, extern supporting communities, uh, they no longer uh, operate as uh, companies, they no longer have boards uh, and both companies have been formally dis dissolved. Um, uh, and beneath the boards then we also have uh, three board committees. So uh, the three board committees that we have with an extern are the Audit and Risk Committee, uh, the Business Development Committee, and the Nominations and Remuneration Committee. And Johnny, whenever he gets to his part of the uh, presentation, will be giving you a bit more information on what uh, each of these uh, committees do uh, uh, whenever, when, whenever they meet. So move, moving on to the next slide then, uh, as uh, Alan has indicated, our boards uh, are comprised of a very broad range of skills, experience uh, and knowledge. And uh, the external group board, it has seven members. So Alan, uh, as you will uh, now know, he's, he's the external group chair. Uh, Aideen Darcy, uh, she's the uh, external group treasurer. And uh, Ian McAvoy, he's the company secretary. Uh, and all three of those uh, group board members are joined by Jim, uh, Andrew, Brendan and Stephen, and as I say, they bring a huge range of expertise and knowledge uh, to the work uh, of the extern group uh, board. Uh, the, the group board itself, uh, it meets uh, every other month, uh, and essentially what the group board is responsible for is firstly delegating uh, authority for decision making uh, throughout the organisation. So, Essentially, they uh, uh, allow for delegation of authority to, for example, chief executive, uh, to the senior leadership team, um, and they delegate authority to all levels uh, within the organisation. A really important function of the external group board 
is the approval of all policies. So all policies that we have with an extern, they are all considered uh, and critiqued uh, by the extern group board. And that's a really important function uh, that the, the group board uh, undertakes. The group board as well is also responsible for undertaking formal reviews uh, of all of the board's uh, performance. So itself uh, and also the two uh, operating companies. Uh, and also it's responsible for um, monitoring the work of uh, committees and uh, monitoring the performance of the three committees that Johnny will talk to you about, uh, as well as individual uh, board trustees. Moving on then to the uh, two operating companies, so that's Extern NI and Extern Ireland. Uh, you'll see on the right hand side of that uh, screen uh, the information on uh, the membership of both uh, of those uh, operating companies. Uh, and again, like the extern group board, both extern Northern Ireland and extern Ireland, uh, they meet on a bi-monthly basis. Uh, membership, as you would expect, is made up from a very diverse and broad uh, range of experience and knowledge. And ultimately, uh, the operating companies exist uh, essentially to provide some accountability to what uh, is being delivered through our services directorate. So, for example, uh, Leslie Leslie Ann Scott, who's the director of services in ROI, uh, she would very much lead in that relationship uh, with the External Ireland Group Board, and she would, for example, report on you know maybe new developments within services. She would report on performance uh, within services in the south of Ireland, and that's really where the key point of accountability lies. And then conversely, uh, Billy, as director of services, services in Northern Ireland, he would report directly uh, to the extern Northern Ireland uh, operating company. So ultimately the purpose of the two subsidiary companies is to act as strategic uh, decision maker uh, for decisions that relate specifically to services uh, within uh, extern. Another really key uh, responsibility is approval of annual budgets and monitoring. So obviously Pauline is uh, Director of Finance and Corporate Services. Uh, she would take the lead in working with uh, directors across the organisation in developing budgets. And ultimately, uh, they would be presented uh, to the two subsidiary boards uh, for approval. Pauline would also bring management accounts uh, to both, uh, both the uh, operating company board meetings. Uh, uh, and they would be uh, monitored by uh, trustees within uh, each of those subsidiary boards. I did re reference the uh, role of the two subsidiary boards in monitoring performance. So obviously uh, you, you will be aware of the business plans that we have in place and have had in place for a number of years now. So uh, both Leslie and Billy as uh, directors of services in both jurisdictions, they would bring reports on uh, per, uh, performance in uh, delivering uh, the range of projects that we deliver across the organization. Another key purpose of uh, the operating companies is to ensure compliance with uh, statutory uh, and uh, regulatory obligations. Uh, so we have a responsibility, for example, to uh, ensure that uh, we are meeting all of the statutory requirements uh, that are that are written within charity law, both in the north uh, and in the south. Uh, so we would bring regular reports to both uh, subsidiary boards on how we are uh, meeting our compliance responsibilities. Uh, a particular area of uh, and a particular uh, interest to me is around GDPR. Obviously, I'm responsible for ensuring GDPR compliance. Again, reports on our compliance in that area would be brought uh, to the boards uh, and also uh, Specifically in Extern Ireland, uh, legally, Extern is required to report on any lobbying uh, that our staff or our board members have undertaken uh, with, for example, senior civil servants or with politicians uh, in, in the Republic of Ireland. So again, I would bring uh, reports to the uh, Extern Ireland board meeting, uh, again, about, uh, I suppose, providing assurance to the uh, board members that we are delivering compliance on, on, on all of those fronts. Uh, the board committees, which Johnny will talk to you about very shortly, uh, they we, we, we provide reports and uh, report to the committee. So a lot of the reports that are presented to the, those committees are, are also brought uh, to the uh, operating committee boards. Uh, and then finally, uh, the 
uh, operating committees have a, a, a really important responsibility in improving uh, approving our uh, financial statements, uh, as well as the annual reports uh, that we produce as an organisation. So at that point, I now hand over to Johnny, who's going to take you through uh, each of the three committees that we have within our overall governance structures. OK, um, thanks, Gavin. Um, I, I'm going to talk to you for about five minutes on, on, on the three um, board committees that um, we, we have within the organisation, uh, audit and risk, nominations and remuneration and business development. Um, and we'll, we'll talk about the audit and risk committee first. Um, it, each of the committees is chaired by a trustee and, and for the audit and risk committee, it's, it's Brendan Johnson. And, and th there's an accountability uh, for, for key staff stakeholders uh, and, and the two uh, key points of contact for that committee would be Pauline in, in her role as Director of Finance and Corporate Services um, and, and the CEO. Um, all of the committees meet every other month. Um, and again, uh, th there's a membership of each of those committees. And again, uh, th there is a uh, a range of people uh, fr from the board that would be on those committees, uh, usually um, representatives of both Extern Northern Ireland Board and Extern um, Ireland Board, and, and obviously people then who would be um, on the group board. Uh, in terms of the purpose um, of the Audit and Risk com com um, Committee, is to report to the group board on the implementation of externs groups risk management process to review the effectiveness of management approaches and maintaining internal controls to review management procedures for monitoring external groups compliance and legal obligations overseeing the coordination of internal and external audits engaging external consultants and experts uh, when required for advice um, and overseeing the overall effectiveness um, of the, the finance function. And on, on a more practical level, maybe some of the things that, that you, you work on as members of staff that maybe feed into that um, committee would be uh, risk registers. Uh, again, there would be a review of the corporate risk register um, as part of that committee, uh, a review of management accounts, sustainability audits, um, internal audits and audit plans, um, the, the review of non people related policies and again safeguarding reports and improvement plans that would all feed into those are just examples of some of the things that would be discussed and explored at greater depth um, in the audit and risk committee. OK, the next committee we're going to talk about is the nom nominations and remuneration committee um, and uh, that is chaired by um, Alan. Um, and again, from an accountability point of view, the two key stakeholders as staff members would be myself and the CEO. Again, the, all the committees meet every, every other month and uh, there, there are four uh, trustees. So there's Alan, Andrew McCluskey, who's the, who's the vice chair um, uh, of Extern Group, um, Aideen Darcy, who is the Extern NI chair and Jim Daly, who is the Extern Ireland chair. Again, some of the work that the Nominations and Remuneration Committee is involved in um, the, would be the monitor and review of the structure and composition of the board and lead the process for all appointments, ensure fair and equitable decisions in relation to remuneration practices and policies, uh, and ensure there's a framework and policy for the remuneration of staff um, that's developed, reviewed and updated. Management of, of, of other benefits, such as, as, as the pension scheme that we have within the organisation, the pension schemes we have in the organisation. And again, overseeing the effectiveness of, of the HR function. And again, on a more practical basis, some of the things that would be discussed that um, that some of you would feed into um, would be um, things like whistle. If there's whistleblowing complaints, again, those would be things that would be escalated to the committee. Um, significant uh, employee relations issues throughout the organisation. Um, you know, an update um, on organisational proposals and initiatives. For example, we're just about to launch the new People HR system that some of you have been trained on already. So keeping the, the, the um, committee and the boards abreast of, of, of organisational developments and initiatives. Again, uh, we provide a suite of, of HR statistics uh, to, to the uh, committee uh, and, and to the boards, um, again, which is divided into corporate um, um, external NI and external Ireland. And again, we, we analyze things such as absence, turnover, and um, by, by specific directorates. 
Uh, and again, th there would be a review of people related policies um, and again, things that, that would maybe have an impact on, on, on terms and conditions. All of those would be um, things that would, would go through the nominations and remuneration committee. It just gives you a flavour of some of the things that are discussed at that committee on a practical level. And, and the final the final committee is, is, is the Business Development Committee. And again, that is chaired by Andrew McCluskey, who is the extern group vice chair. Uh, and, and the key lead um, internally would be Gavin and the CEO again, uh, like the other committees that meets every other month. And again, uh, listed there are, are some of the trustees um, that are um, involved in the Business uh, Development Committee. Again, some of the things that, that, that uh, from, from a purpose point of view, it is the uh, approve and review externs income generation and fundraising raising strategy. Ensure extern fundraising is in line with the strategic direction of the organisation. To assess new opportunities, for example, business cases. Uh, to monitor the implementation, mergers, acquisitions and partnerships. And again, there's been a number of those um, in externs history. Uh, strategic ass assets management, strategic comms and engagement, and policy and public affairs. And again, some of the standing items um, or things for discussion um, as part of the Business Development Committee would be um, the, the business plan and strategy, updates on marketing, comms, fundraising, uh, and policy and public affairs, and, and, and any new development proposals and initiatives that the organisation is considering. It just gives you a bit of a flavour of, of, of that. So just going back to, to the slide that we talked about before, again, it, it really gives you a bit more of a flavour of, of the cycle. Um, so so all, all of these meetings happen every other month. The committees feed into the operating companies, which which are Extern Ireland and Extern Northern Ireland. And again, um, you know, policies and proposals of jurisdiction um, specific um, would, would possibly be, be considered by either just Extern Ireland or Extern Northern Ireland. But if it's an organi organisational wide issue, obviously it would be considered and or reviewed uh, and potential consideration for approval um, at group level. So it just really gives you an idea of the structure um, and, and the fact that those six six meetings happen every eight weeks. So it's quite an onerous um, cycle. And again, for all of you who are involved in, in collating information um, for, for, for any and all of those meetings, thank you very much indeed, because uh, hopefully it gives you a bit of a clearer understanding as, as to, to where your information goes and where it feeds into the structure. I'm going to hand back to Alan. Thank you. Thank you very much, Johnny. I really appreciate that. And I hope that has been helpful for everyone that has stuck the pace. Um, we're probably at the point now where we could take a few questions. And if there were questions coming up on the chat, um, that would be good also. Uh, I have one question on my chat, I think. I can see, are there any skills gaps across the extern boards that you need to prioritise for your next trustee recruitment? Good question. Thank you, Ian, for that. Um, we are quite careful when we look for new trustees to bring people uh, in balance onto our boards and committees. Um, the biggies for any board would be to have somebody with a legal background and then somebody with a financial background. We also in extern would like to have a um, professional social work background person on our boards and committees as well. So we did a bit of a, a survey um, as to the current board members and where the skills gaps might be. Um, and we did those across a large number of categories. So how much general management business experience did you have? How much financial experience? Have you done any safeguarding? Have you done any governance? Have you done any strategy formation? Have you done any risk management, project management? Do you work in education or government or policy making? Are you aware about homelessness and housing? What about public relations and communications, journalism, mental health, drugs, alcohol, and um, mental health? What what kind of skills can you bring to the table it is always the question that we ask. So yes, we're quite careful at monitoring that. We have lost um, a solicitor on the boards maybe a year ago. 
Um, so we would like somebody next right time round with legal background, which would be good. We have somebody with finance experience on the boards at the moment. We have social work. Um, Brendan Johnson has a professional qualification in social work in the background there. But as boards need refreshed, people move on, people are due to retire, um, and that's the way boards are. So we need to be careful in looking into the future that we get the right ones there. We like business people as well, understand business processes um, and how um, communications and public relations work and communicating to all your stakeholders, your client groups, the public in general, the funders um, and the policy makers in the civil service and all of that. So yes, we need a spread of expertise and everybody on the boards at the moment uh, has something to offer. There's quite a collective wisdom um, and experience around the boardroom tables at the moment. I'm quite pleased with the, the boards we have, but we don't sit at that point. We continually refresh. Good question. Thanks for it. Is that all there is in the chat? Is mine not updating? No, other, uh, there isn't anything further in the chat. I'm just going to ask if anyone would like to, anyone to put their hand up, if you have any questions. I can't see everyone on my screen, so please shout if I if your hand is up and I haven't seen you. I can't believe we answered all your questions in the presentation. Now there must be some questions out there that you'd love to ask. Karen. Thanks, Sharon. Just wondering, does Extern still run the Boardroom Apprentice? And if so, how beneficial has that been to us as an organisation? Yes, Karen, thanks very much. The Boardroom Apprentice is, is a good scheme and we have had actually very good Boardroom Apprentice who's just coming to the end of her term on the Extern Northern Ireland Board and um, with a kind of public relations communications background, which we don't really have at board level uh, too much. So yes, that has been beneficial and she got very involved in, in discussions with us on the way through. It also works both ways. The Boardroom Apprentice uh, loves to get into um, understanding how boards work and what they do um, and look to their future career development as well. It's a very good scheme. Unfortunately, it doesn't run in Ireland at the moment. Um, we're trying to understand if we could facilitate something in Ireland that would match. Um, we have just appointed a new um, boardroom apprentice to Northern Ireland. And we will see how that develops into the future as well. Uh, good scheme, Karen. Yeah, we commend it. I see the boardroom is the either boardroom. comment on that or ask a question. I'm not sure which. Yeah, just, just, just to add to your comments, uh, Alan. Um, our uh, current board, board, boardroom apprentice, Ashley Morrow, she uh, has had a lot of experience working for charities before, and she she's a lot of experience in developing fundraising campaigns. So just from a very practical point of view, Karen, uh, Ashley has provided Grace and I with some superb uh, feedback on the fundraising campaigns that we've uh, delivered previously. So we're we're planning to implement uh, you know that that, that feedback uh, for future campaigns. So it's, it's been really beneficial. Uh, you know, speaking very personally, it's been very beneficial uh, for me uh, uh, and for the wider team. So it, it's a super, super scheme, and uh, you know, obviously, it's a benefit to the individuals who participate in the scheme as well. So I really, really, very warmly commend it. It's it's brilliant, really good. That's great. Thanks, because I can understand what the apprentice gets out of it. So um, no, delighted to hear what we've we've got out of it. You know, in her part of a two-way uh, partnership. No, that's great. Thank you, guys. Thanks. Um, Thomas, I think right, that's thanks. Thomas's hand up. Yes. Yep, it is. Thanks. It's a bit bit smaller than usual. Is <laughs> Alan? Hi. Um, as your role as a lay manager, um, my background, I would have took a lot of cases to court, and now you know yourself, it's the last, last, last resort to be go to court. We try everything possible before before we go to court. But is there anything did you think could change, and and link that in with Axtern, is there additional services we could put in in that role to prevent going to court or maybe a service after through court? Is there anything from your role saying that? 
Um, not so much to bring to the table um, from the role in court, um, but the, the, there is translation um, and linkages, you know. Um, I had a, a recent court case which linked to the drug deaths in Belfast, for example. Um, so uh, the board took a courageous decision um, to endorse a policy of um, overdose prevention facility in Belfast and has taken a lead in, in public um, on doing that. Uh, that would be tremendously helpful because some of the foundation problems in court and um, particularly family proceedings court come from alcohol addictions, come from drugs or come from paramilitaries. Um, and when we think into a trauma-informed organization in the future, which is the direction we're heading as an organization, those issues in Northern Ireland and in Ireland generally are very real in people backgrounds and understanding those and carrying that forward into the ethos of the organization is good. Also looking at the moment, for example, in ROI where we have field supervision um, ish, uh, projects running in three areas in the south, keen to see if that can translate up into Youth Court in Northern Ireland. Um, the youth court in Northern Ireland is quite good at doing diversions um, under the restorative justice practice, so we'll have to explore there uh, how, that, how that might come about. Um, the other thing that the courts haven't cottoned on to particularly yet in Northern Ireland at the juvenile level um, is the question of holistic solutions, and I think Extern can do the holistic solutions. There's been a good pilot running and Judge Bagnall brought forward um, to do a, a court tied into health. Uh, and the pilot has been quite successful, so we're hoping that it will roll, roll out across all the courts. Um, but the basic idea is, why have you got yourself in front of the magistrate's court? Is it because of drugs? Is it because of alcohol? How do we solve those issues as well as deal with your criminality? and let's get a full solution and that court has the practitioners um, from social work, social care in, in play in court and tries to give a wraparound solution. Extern can do that, Extern does do that and does it very well. So yes, we can offer services like that uh, at, 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 at the youth stage, which I think is very helpful indeed. Great, thank you. Good to meet you on screen, Thomas. <laughs> Welcome. Thank you. So was there further comment from the boardroom there? Or is Kate, oh, sorry, you have your hand sorry, up. Sorry, sorry, Pauline. Sorry, Alan, I was going to ask, is there a provider involved in that pilot scheme from the um, charity sector? In the adult youth court, in the adult magistrates court, yeah. I'm not I'm not aware of that pilot, but um, we could we could access that polling. Um, I'm sure. Yeah, check up what's working. Yeah. I think you had said to me previously, Alan, you could see a role for the intensive family home support type yeah. services as well in the north, isn't it? Yeah. Okay. yeah. Thanks, Polly. Yeah. Is that? Right. Hi, um, thanks. Uh, firstly, just wanted to say thanks to the board for supporting our petition for an overdose prevention facility because it's something that um, we, we've been working towards for a long time and I, I think it really places us at the forefront of that that's, that sort of space um, and we've all been fairly committed to it over the last lot of years with the, with the most um, commitment and passion coming from from Boff obviously who's one of one of the project managers I have and I'm sure you've seen him on the media recently so it's been really really well received you know pretty much across the board from what we can ascertain at this point Alan um, but also obviously really appreciate that the board have got behind that 
um, because that that means that that we can move forward with that agenda, which is pretty critical. Um, you know, and obviously you know that yourself from what you were expressing there. Um, so thanks very much, and please pass that on to your colleagues as well, because it's not often we get a chance to do a face to face. So, um, that that has really helped. Um, it'll help the service users obviously, um, and it'll help hopefully to move things on in the in the longer term. Um, I, I wanted to ask a question if it's okay, and I hope, hopefully it's not too invasive and I don't mean it to be, but I'm just wondering how the board in general, the boards in general, have coped over the last couple of years with there being so much sort of difficulty going on. And I don't mean that in a personal way, I just mean, you know, how, how as a board have you managed that? I know it's been difficult for staff, but it, it would be good to hear how you've all coped with that, because I suppose there's a, an additional layer of accountability and responsibility that you all have to take on board, you know? I yeah. hope that's not too impertinent a question. No, that's a very realistic and practical um, question, and it has to be faced up, um, Kate, I have to say. So um, we have had three big, huge issues to face. Um, there was safeguarding, and there was safeguarding communication. Those are actually quite separate in a way. Mm -hmm. um, and then there's been external works, and then mm -hmm. Lately, there's been a question of uh, how the monies and reserves are held between ourselves and Tusla in, in ROI. Those are all huge and they're beyond um, any board trustees members ex expectation. So if I took the first one first, um, we worked very hard to get the safeguarding dealt with properly and professionally and we did that as, as boards. But the big issue there came when the communication was not signed between Extern and Tusla, um, who had an interest in the services that were provided. Um, and that, that was really hard because Tusla relations had always been very good and mm -hmm. they had been betrayed by that. But in ROI, there seemed to be a perception that um, if a big safeguarding incident occurred, the thing to do as a board member was to resign. So we lost from the Ireland board some key people um, over the head of that who resigned because they felt it was the honourable thing to do. And that left mostly Northern Ireland resident people having to carry the weight of extern Ireland for a period until we appointed new trustees. And actually I'm interviewing this week for further new trustees for the Irish board to bring it up to strength. So you do take a bit of a battering uh, and it's a mark of your commitment um, that you see these things through. You do, in the case of extern works, end up in front of very senior civil servants and writing to the head of the civil service in Northern Ireland about these issues and ministers um, and asking them to intervene and using all the connections you can bring to bear. Um, and it's not an easy job when it gets to that stage. Um, but I'm really grateful to my fellow trustees for sticking together as a unified board and dealing with these professionally and well, um, and employing outside help when we need it, um, which is also a big thing, it was a big thing in safeguarding, a big thing in extern works, and knowing when to do that and how to prioritize the work and make sure that the, the charity overall is held in good shape, it's held in good reputation, it's held in a sound financial basis, and it's held looking to the future with good hope and good passion for the work. And that, that at the end of the day, is what I hope we've managed to do through a very bumpy um, two years. I think we've turned a good corner quite recently, mm -hmm. and I think uh, with a fair wind, Xterns future is very secure indeed, and I have great confidence in the senior team, in the trustees, and in the staff uh, to take us forward into the future. This has been really helpful to me to, to hear the questions and the things that concern today. Uh, but to assure you that the board is committed um, to, the boards are committed um, mm. to make the, the organization go forward and go well. And we spent last Saturday uh, looking at where we want to be in five years time as an organization with the senior team. And that was a great day as well. Not a topic for another day, perhaps. <laughs> okay, thank you so much for, for being so honest. It's really helpful.
it's good for it's good for us to hear from from a board perspective also thanks very much for that Kate. appreciate the question that's been a great hour folks hasn't it mm -hmm. hey well if there's no other questions i don't see any other hands up then i'm i'm going to draw this lunch and learn to a close um i'll give you the heads up on the next lunch and learn but firstly i'd like to thank um alan for your time and giving that up today really i know everyone will really appreciate that and kate you have summed that up really nice in your sentiments so thank you and thank you to johnny and gavin for for your input and your commitment uh, to pulling this together as well which was excellent uh, as i said it's been recorded it'll be uploaded to sharepoint um, and really just giving you the heads up I, I don't have the date for september yet but it'll be towards the end of September and the theme is um, heads up um, and minding your mental health uh, in the workplace. So Team Energize are going to bring that to us towards the end of September and hopefully next week we'll get the date out so you can put it in your diaries. So thank you everyone very much for giving up your time um, today and I hope it was useful and indeed as always if there's any questions, any suggestions um, around any future lunch and learns, please do let either Ruth, Ali or myself know and we'll be delighted to accommodate you. So thank you everyone. Until next time, thank you. Thank you. Thank Take you. Care, everyone. Thanks, Thanks Bob. Thanks, Thanks very much. Bye-bye. Thank Bye -bye. you.